ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to our studio, Woodbury House. I've got uh, two really cool guests here today. We're going to talk about passion assets from ours, uh, ours, cars, watches, and uh, also art. We've got Charlie Groom here from uh, the London Watch Show, and also Tom Exton. Um, we're obviously going to be having an open and frank conversation about how the pandemic's affected passion assets, what's been happening in this space over the last 12, 18 months. And then again, more importantly, talking about the London Watch Show, which kicks off in September on the 18th and 19th. So welcome chaps. Thank you for your time. Thanks for having me, Charlie, we'll start about uh, talking, uh, talking about the London Watch Show then. Yeah. What's the kind of uh, reason why you're doing it? How did you start the brand? Why did you get into that space? Uh, it's a good question. Basically, obviously, you know, I've got two partners as well. We obviously been selling watches for the uh, best part of 10 years. And around the world, you've got watch shows in Munich, Miami, Hong Kong, Vegas. We used to literally just having a conversation one day and we said, it's crazy, there's not one in London, really, like one of the richest capitals in the globe. And uh, yeah, the, the, the idea just matured from there. I sort of took the first steps, you know, setting the business up, getting a bit of branding done. Um, but then very quickly it matured into more of a lifestyle um, show. Obviously still ultimately surrounding the watch industry, but, you know, we had big companies contact us that do, you know, bespoke jewellery boxes and bespoke safes and, you know, interior designers, because obviously they see that what the opportunity had, the platform was, you know, a lot of people in one room potentially buying or at least shopping for higher net worth products. So, um, yeah, we just sort of took the steps to keep growing it and growing it and growing it. And then, you know, where we are, where we are now today. So we've got multiple different brands, got uh, it's about 50, 60 companies, independent companies of watch businesses. And then the rest of the build up is all high end, luxurious businesses, cars, yeah. planes, etc. Et I was going to say that because obviously when we first went to the space in, in, in Park Lane, really nice hotel. Yeah. yeah. Very, very good space as well. Yeah. Very professional. Um, <clears throat> I just started seeing our, all the extra brands which are not directly linked to watches yeah. um, coming come, come to you and asking for a space here because they all know it's going to be a very, very successful event. Um, I know there's property guys there, I think even. Yeah, uh, property investment companies, obviously yourself, your house. We're obviously doing a talk about the art market the as art a whole, market, streets yeah. art, but then specifically pigeonholing it into who we represent the most, which is Richard Hamilton, the Godfather Street Art. Yeah. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of cross-pollination there because I think that if you're into art, you're probably into watches. If you're into watches, you're probably into cars. If you're into cars, you probably have a nice home or certainly yeah. into property. Yeah. If you've got a nice property and a portfolio, you're into a lifestyle, the jets, yeah. the, the, the yachts. Okay. And even if you don't have the money at the moment, even if you just go to the event and just get a bit, a bit of inspiration, that could be the inspiration you need to start a business or to venture into these areas and to get yourself a bit more educated. And who knows, you know, going to this type of event for me, it's not just about what you're gonna see and hear, but it's also about the network. The old cliche saying is, your net worth is determined by your network. Yeah. And I, I certainly do that. I couldn't that. agree more to be honest with you. I think, I, I, and you know, leading from what you said, it's more for, you know, the experience of it all, because some people, you know, they, they might not be in the opportunity right now to purchase anything like you said, but just the fact that they can go there and they've got as much really as they probably are ever going to have in front of them, you know, ranging from watches, cars, are, you know, I think it's just a good, a good day out, weekend out for anybody, really. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <clears throat> so Tom, uh, introducing you now, sir. Um, Thank you very much. I used to speak to you some time ago via social media. We actually didn't ever actually meet um even though i was in sort of we were pen pals weren't we on instagram we certainly was <laughs> we certainly was and um as i mentioned to you off air your 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 own image your own brand your own sort of ne network has completely exploded so talk to us since like 2012 i think it was 2013 how's life been for you and how have you suddenly become you know a, a good hard-working man into this kind of social kind of let's call it celebrity that's pushing it, but I'll take it for now. Um, I, I guess I, I had a fitness business uh, we set up in like sort of 2012, and uh, as I was discussing off air like a little while ago with you guys, I started just buying kind of cars and just indulging my passion, so cars and watches, and I realised online there was a fraternity of guys 
predominantly guys, I mean, my audience is like literally 99% of guys that wanted to see the cars, wanted to see the watches, but also wanted to know how that comes about, how that happens. And it kind of, uh, coupled with my business exploding and um, me working in the city at the same time, I was indulging my passions. And then I realized that was getting eyeballs and the whole thing just kind of snowballed from there to the point that I'm now full time making content surrounding cars and watches and literally just the eyeballs that I get off that, you know, you can monetize and like, yeah, grow your own brands with and work with, partner up with different brands. So yeah, it's really cool. And I'm obviously really excited to be part of the watch show. Yeah. 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 It, kind of a bit ambassadoring it. Yeah, it's good. Um, and I'm, I'm actually, I would have gone anyway, to be honest yeah. with you. So scratch yeah, good. I scratch think free it's, tickets off you. It's but, all worked quite well. I think, especially how we're all, how we're all here now, yeah. to be honest with you. It's, quite interesting how things will fall into place. Definitely, there's a lot of synergy between us and certainly the areas that we're in. So look, not every artist, not every watch, not every car will go up in value. Um, so a, a bit of you know um, guidance, a little bit of education from you guys. Uh, let's start with watches. I yeah. mean, how do we know, how do the audience know which ones to collect, which ones to wear, which ones are the right brands to buy? Or is it just, you know, kind of just go into one that you like and hope for the best? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I think with watches, it's, I think of any investment, really, you always look at the past track history, right? Mm. And with watches, you know, the, the, the history speaks for itself. For example, the watch I've got on my wrist today, stainless steel Daytona 116520. I remember buying this watch, or well, not this specific watch, but this model, less than six, seven years ago for five, six thousand pounds. This watch market value today is not far from twenty thousand pounds. So I think you know, as long as you're picking the right watches, which again is obviously the answer to your question, I think you've got to go with a watch that's one, you know, an iconic watch, one that's got a lot of demand and not easily in supply. Um, but yeah, obviously you've got your big names like Patek Philippe, obviously Rolex, um, Audemars Piguet, and obviously Richard Mille. Yeah, you would call them more like the blue chip kind of. Yeah, I mean... Companies or brands to buy? Yeah, I definitely would. I mean, Richard Mille this year has just been insane. I was saying uh, literally five minutes ago, wasn't I? You know, the, the, the rate in which they've grown is so fast, but now they're having a little bit of a correction because of the, the rapid rate. But I do believe in any market, whether it be property, I don't know, really know too much about cars, but in any market, when things grow and explode in terms of the price, they always do have to fall back a little bit and have a little bit of a correction to find their solid base and then go again. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think the, the watch market as a whole is always going up. Uh, and as long as you don't make a silly decision and buy something at too much of a hefty cost and you do your own due diligence, um, I think you'll always be okay, really. Yeah. And sort of same sort of uh, question to you, Tom. I, I'm not too sure if you actually really trade the cars, but obviously you must have a great bit of knowledge about it. I was saying to you earlier that I'm clucking to get back in a supercar. Yeah. I'd love, love to get a, a Lambo. And I've got to say the one that probably is my favorite to look at. I haven't driven one. I've driven the Aventador Rest, but I've never driven a, uh, an SV or an SVJ. And you gave me a bit of advice saying maybe, you know, the SV might be the one to hold on to, to, to yeah. long, long term. I think so. I think um, yeah, the SV is good news. Don't get it with the carbon seats unless you no. unless you like back pain. Um, but they I think, have the performance where they used to have the rigid carbon oh, seats. Oh, they're and, horrendous. Yeah, they're so bad. I used to get my pillow from indoors and literally <laughs> stick it in the car and, and sit there. And I used to convince myself, "Hey, fine, it's fine, it's fine." As soon as my missus got in there, she was like, "What? Did you buy this car?" <laughs> you know, but um, that's 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 the see. I've, I've heard that one before. Yeah. How much was that car back then? Then you were you. So I feel like at the t time I got a bit of a touch on it. Um, yeah. I bought it from uh, Lamborghini Pangborn. I think they were the newest branch for Lamborghini at that period in time. Um, I had a relationship with them because I had a Bentley, which I also bought from Pangborn. And they had it up for brand new 205 and I got it for 174. Sounds good. Yeah, yeah. Which, which was quite good, but I still lost on it when I actually sold, but I think they're going back up now. Yeah, those Perfumantes Gallardo, yeah? Yeah, uh, yeah. convertible. Yeah, 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 I remember All that. You, you caused havoc in that. I remember <laughs> that's what lured me in to sliding into your DMs. I think I was <laughs> causing trouble with that. I think the cars is very much the same as the watches. You know, yeah. it, as they say, with with sort of luxury, buy the icons, buy the, buy anything that's got demand or limited supply, preferably both. Yeah. Uh, something iconic um, and something that's not going to go out of fashion. You know, your, your Submariners and your Daytonas. Yeah. You know, if you, if you put that into kind of 
iconic Ferraris or you know Lamborghini, something that's been part of popular culture, um, <clears throat> particularly on the classic side, something that people have grown up with, and that generation are you know several decades down the line coming into money, that asset's always going to see a spike. You know, mm. so there was a particular asset that I've just bought Testarossa, and I think. You know, there's a generation of people, I don't know about you boys, I don't know how old you are, I might just be dating myself now, but I grew <laughs> up with, with testosterone batting around the place, one on my wall. Yeah, 355, so I, I used to have up on my wall. Yeah, 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 there we go. Yeah. Um, kind of roughly the same sort of yeah. thing, V8, um, Fat 12, whatever. Um, and that kind of generation now, I mean, generally speaking, now sort of coming into money, they get into an age where they've got more disposable, so that's when things start spiking. Um, and it will continue to when you know people are always coming to their 40s and 50s responsibilities start dropping and they, they have more cash to play around with. so same sort of thing but i usually just go on gut feeling just have a little flutter see what happens but yeah. i've been in and out of about 30 35 cars in the past few years so oh, yeah and by and large i haven't lost my shirt on any of them bar maybe two or three really that's yeah. quite surprising that really so people always say they say you keep coming out of these cars you, you're losing money on all of them surely like cars lose money and you're like, Really? Yeah, yeah. Obviously, I do it for business as well, so it's a bit different. I'm not kind of Joe Blogs in it. You're it's not taking like massive hits on. Um, I, I bought a Lusso, to, a Ferrari Lusso, you know, the estate car yeah. one. Um, oh, to, I love them. To, to get V12 or V8? Yeah, they're great. They're brilliant. They're just not brand new. What, what one? V8, V12? I had the V8 Turbo one, oh, uh, Next Demo, which got discount on, but I still did 60 grand and I've sat it once. But most people did over 100. Um, but yeah, it's, it's like the watch thing as well. Ferrari will make you buy a turd to get the equivalent um, of a Daytona. Yeah, yeah, right. So Rolex make you buy yeah, yeah. some women's turd yeah, to, do, yeah. to potentially yeah, get a steel piece. And there were loads of guys that bought these things and didn't even get a piece yeah. which turned out to not even be the investment or save money that people thought they were going to be anyway. But I'm not really the not, same game. It's it's complete parallels, yeah. watch the cars. I'm not as much into my cars as you two, but I see a car the other day, and excuse me if I'm wrong, but is it the new Roma, Ferrari Roma? If you do that, we'll fall out. Really? <laughs> It's terrible. Don't really? do it. Yeah. If you like, if really you like, like the money, it. I like the look of it. Though. I think it looks slick. Just give me a pile and I'll set fire to it for a small fee. <laughs> well, Instead they're, of doing they're, that, they're, 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 they're off, they? yeah, really? yeah. Despite Why what it's is off, that um, because they're just going to make forty-five billion of them. Um, there isn't really a demand for that car. It's oh. not anything revolutionary over and above what's already been out. Uh, your, your Cali T, your Portofino. Yeah, V8 Lusso Turbo, yeah. which are all cars that have tanked already, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then loads of them about. Are you going to spend two, like, yeah, two twenty, two thirty? Just, them, just, just run it by me. I don't, I don't like to shatter your dreams. But you buy, like, get a Lusso, get that Lusso uh, V8 Turbo. If you just want one that you can just bat around town in, you've got to start, stop. Not going to use too much fuel. But um, really? yeah, you could really, really come on start the wrong way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Glad yeah. I mentioned. And it. the tech in them's fiddly and awful. Really? I think you'll hate it. The back seats are terrible as well. Just don't do it, please. So, um, sorry. Oh, no, no, good. Um, so, there's something I mentioned in previous podcasts. Um, as you well know, I run my own podcast and also do a lot of content that's cross pollination between my own stuff and also Woodby House. And we look at a lot of data. And we bought some data from City Private Bank, which is part of the City Group uh, organization. To become an investor with City Private Bank, you need to have a net worth of at least $25 million upwards. They invest your money into about 13, 14 different asset classes from equity-based uh, investments, bonds, cash, property, um, commodities, contemporary street art, etc. And what they did is they released a report between the years of 1985 to 2020, so 35 years span. And what they found is over that 35 years, year in, year out, bearing in mind we had at least three aggressive recessions during that time period, Contemporary street art was performing at 11.5 to 11.7% year in, year out. Now that's generally across the board. When you start pigeonholing Jean-Michel Basquiat, Keith Haring, Banksy, Richard Hamilton, you start to see that they're actually performing much higher. So question I wanted to ask you guys is, um, during the pandemic since last year, yeah. I mean, how is, have you seen more uptake with orders, with watches and people buying cars? Do you think people have been a bit more reserved? What was the general sort of sen sentiment out there? Uh, do you want me to go first? You can crack on, yeah. yeah. Um, I'll be honest with you, I, I, I found it pretty much insane how much people were spending, considering there was a global pandemic going on, you know? Um, it was madness. People were still buying watches. If anything, they were buying more watches. 
I don't know whether that's, you know, me and my partner's had many conversations whether we think it's because bored, we're bored, bored got nothing else yeah. to do, so they thought we'll buy some watches because they've got spare money sitting there, really, or... Well, you know? if you look at Amazon, I mean, obviously, yeah, he's the Amazon. richest man in, yeah. man in the world. That's I mean, crazy. ridiculous amount of money, shooting himself up to space yesterday uh, yeah, as well. Oh, yeah, so. um, but, uh, you know, his, 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 his network and, uh, net worth and his brand and, his, and the value of his company has been going up because people are indoors and maybe it's a bit of boredom buying. They are online and it's probably going to yeah. be happening with art, watches and also yeah. ordering a new car. I mean, a friend of mine I spoke to yesterday who's in the whiskey trade, which is another asset which is going really well. Yeah. He literally said to me, he specced up a new Pulse for under 40 grand. He went, I don't know, know, know why I got it. It's just I was sitting there, I'm so bored. And, you know, yeah. I wanted to, wanted to do, do something with my money. So I think there's a might be a bit of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. You've been coming, you know, buying some outrageous cars as well. So is part of that, you know, a little bit of boredom or just want to change it up or? Uh, I've been buying different stuff over the past probably year or so. I've been putting more money into like the old, old kind of iconic stuff. So your old Porsches, your old Ferraris, that kind of thing. Um, but certainly in my field, just as an online, influencer horrible word but whatever it is yeah. it's gone mental it's gone absolutely mental over the past year or so and to be for, before the kind of pandemic really fully kicked off i said you know once we start coming out of this and we start seeing light at the end of the tunnel anyone who was reserved is going to go absolutely potty there's so much revenge spending and i think what a lot of kind of forecasters didn't build in was just humans being humans human psyche you know <clears throat> Um, look what happens at the end of end of wars. People go absolutely bonkers, you know. They start breeding, spending as much money as they can, and you know the pandemic is like that. Except there's no, no real damage to infrastructure, but just a bit of a pause. Mm. So I wasn't surprised that it's gone absolutely bonkers. Um, but yeah, the, the car market, brand new cars have been put on hold due to Brexit, pandemic, and there's some issue with um, some like microchips or whatever. So supply's been strangled of brand new cars. Coupled with the fact that brand new cars now, a lot of the stuff that's coming out, people don't want. So your Romas, for example, right. you know, in the in the proper car nerdy fraternity, nobody wants that stuff. They'd rather a four five eight from sort of many moons ago. This might be going over your head a little bit. You might not be. No, no, no I'm taking. It on board. Are you in? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm taking. It <laughs> yeah. I'm definitely. You're, yeah, 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 so yeah, yeah. The four five eights and whatever. They, you know, they're more popular now than the four eight eights and the, and the newer models. It so sounds better as well, and it's it a bit more. Better. It's a bit more raw. And what I what I. I've been saying this for, for a few years, you know more about cars than I do, but I feel like Ferrari started taking that leap into like the turbocharged cars before Lamborghini did. And I think, I understand why, yeah. but the downside is I feel like it's losing a bit of its passion. Yeah. I think the, you know, uh, the, the Lamborghinis are still raw. And the, the analogy I used to give people, which is a bit of a, a, a bad one, and I hope my missus is not listening to this, but. The Ferrari is like the wife that you marry, you know, perfect textbook, you know, ne you know, you're always going to, she was always going to serve you well, but every so often there's a naughty weekend away and the Lamborghini <laughs> is that one that you want. You almost stay with it forever, but three, three nights is great. Yeah. You know, that's how I used to say, say I'll turn up in a Lamborghini cars. and the missus might be watching, so I'm not <laughs> I don't know what you mean. Um, but no, you're definitely right. They, they jumped into the turbocharging thing too early. They dropped Pin and Farina's, their designer, which is like a classic, you know, Italian coach, coach works, um, company like iconic. They've been designing their cars for decades. They, uh, they started doing all their ha you know, designs in house. Yeah. So they dropped two things the, the noise and the kind of classic design was styling. Uh, and they also ramped up production and they started making new models that no one wanted. Uh, and they started tanking in F1. So that's just Ferrari in isolation. Yeah. You know, that's just one brand. So the, the older stuff, uh, it's it's just gone it's just gone a lot better. Uh, Did the price go up during uh, the pandemic on all the cars as well? So yeah, I think I think in some models it did, yeah. but now it's just absolutely mental. You speak to kind of you know your big independent dealers like Romans, um, they've got premises they can't fill with cars, they cannot get stock. Stop, yeah. um, you know, most of my cars now are up. I can get out of all my cars that profit now. Really? It's really good Bar. stuff. Yeah. Replacement for that no, premium. couldn't, but you know, I've got, <laughs> got an Uber account. <laughs> Sadiq will make less money off me if I did. So, uh, I want to ask you guys both a question which I get <clears> asked <throat> all the time, being in the art space is you know, who really drives this market? So, with, with Hamilton or certainly any good blue chip street artist, I think the end user is the person with who wants the most bragging rights. And I'll give you an example. 
the guy who bought the Jean-Michel Basquiat back in 2017 by a Japanese billionaire for $110.5 million, he actually uh, set the record previously for for uh, the other two by Jean-Michel Basquiat. So he's got three Jean-Michel Basquiat's, which is basically setting them around $200 million plus. Now for me, why would you want $200 million in three pieces of art? For me, I think it's all about bragging rights. There's also another guy called Ken Griffin who's worth about $16 billion, head fund guy, quite flamboyant. In actual fact, you may remember him because at the start of the pandemic, he'd done a selfie in his super yacht, $100 million yacht, and he said, um, I'm escaping the virus, I'm isolating on my yacht, I hope everybody's well. And the, the media had a field day there, it's like, you're rubbing your wealth on people's faces, it's very distasteful, you, you're mocking the general public, you know, how could you do this? Well, anyway, he ended up buying, in the height of the pandemic, a, another Jean-Michel Basquiat for $100 million. Now, just knowing what I know of him only through the media, and I don't know him personally, I've never met him in my life, but it's, it's again about the bragging rights. And it's people like me and my clients who've done very, very well financially off the back end of Hamilton, we are the ones trading it in between from buyers to sellers because eventually we're gonna serve the people that want the bragging rights. So going back to someone like cars or watches, why would someone want to buy a million pound watch? Why would someone want to buy a three million pound LaFerrari? You know, why would they want to do that? Is it because they really want to enjoy it or is it because a bit of bragging rights where they're very, very successful friends? I just want to see your interpretation of that. I think on the car side, there is a lot of willy waving. Um, very definitely, but you got to remember the guys coming in and out of these things and, and buying it, your laughs and your, your big stuff. They're not idiots, you know. They will very rarely do stuff that they think they're going to dump a load of cash on. They will be flamboyant and they'll rub it around the place <coughs> and they'll willy wave and they kind of they, they want to do the bragging rights things. But I think it's a testament to the asset, the fact they're investing in it. They're, they're never going to do something that they think they're going to burn cash on. So I think whilst yes, they are doing for bragging rights, I think you've got to remember that there's a reason why 99% of them are in that position because they're switched on and they can they can spot where things are going. So. Um, yeah, but you, you kind of your hurricanes and your, your kind of more um, standard stuff, kind of stuff that I buy. A lot of it is people that just want to drive past people at bus stops and rev at them and, and yeah. wind them up and make them feel bad about their afternoon. <laughs> there is a lot of that, that, that and there's no denying that. And they're not buying it for an investment purpose. You know, they're just buying a mass-produced supercar and they think, you know what, if I lose 10 grand on a year, 20 grand on a year, um, sod it, it's been worth it for all the people I've annoyed with it. So I think there are, there is a couple of different categories. I suspect there's some parallels with watches as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's very similar, I'd say. Uh, obviously, the people that are spending sort of 100 plus on a watch, they're not idiots, are they? So, you know, obviously there is a certain amount of boasting and look at my watch, look what I've got. But I also think that a lot of the market is driven by the people that you know, the, the, you know, especially the higher end of the market, which is what we're talking about, right? You know, it's driven by the people that you know that collect the watches. A lot of them, a lot of our clients, they've not just got the one watch; you know, they've got like a collection, and they do adore their collection. You know, um, so I think it's a, very, a bit of a hard question to answer. I think because you've got it's a very mixed bag, isn't it? You know, you probably have got the odd person out there that will say fifty k. That's every single penny they've got. And they'll go and buy a watch and they roll around with it and. Good luck to them if that's what they want to do. That's mm. still me today. <laughs> <laughs> but then obviously you've got the other the other side of it that the people that have, you know they build their collection so they'll have a mixed bag of all different types of watches, and, and they won't buy a watch unless they do think it's going to be good for them. Yeah. Um, they won't just buy a watch. I've got a couple of good clients and I could sell a watch. I could put a hefty bit of profit on it, and, and I just know they'd be like, no, it's not for me. Then you know? they're yeah. still very intelligent people. So yeah. Um, might be a little bit different for, for, for art and watches and cars, maybe. I think, you know, again, there's similar sort of mindsets and similar sort of reasons. 100%, yeah. But, you know, I, I, I certainly see it from, you know, people that buy these big Picassos, you know, Jean-Michel Basquiat, even some of the banks and stuff. You know, it, it does sometimes come down to, to, to bragging rights. These yeah. are the general conversations I'm having with some of these collectors because some of them don't even put it in their house, houses. Yeah. So you can't even say that they're, yeah, they're doing it to enjoy it. it. Yeah. They're literally plugging it away. I think with art, it's different though. With, you know, the market's fairly transparent. Am I right? Am I wrong? You know, the big auctions, you can, you can yes see what no. the, the big boys, like the 100 mil ones, you know, yeah. you know who's bought it, you know what it's gone for. And by sheer virtue of the fact that someone's bought 
that piece of art for 100 mil, yeah. it's now worth 100 mil. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's no intrinsic value yeah. in, in anything. It's all canvas with you know, paint on it or whatever it's made of that day. I think you know, if someone has barged in 100 mil in five years time, you know, well, it was 100 mil back then, you know, I think art's slightly different to watches. And you know what I would say as well, just like I said, it's coming to my head. With the watches, let's lose Mark Wahlberg, for example, yeah? So he's got a huge watch collection. Now, he's just got hold of the 5711 with the green dart, right? Now, that watch in the grey market is probably, people are probably asking for between 150 and 200k. Now, retail is like, I think it's 20, 30 grand between that bracket. He would have not paid. 150 to 100 with a paper retail, so it's hard, isn't it? Because he yeah. certainly isn't boasting about it, yeah, because he's probably paid retail. Do you get what mm. I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so it's, it's really tricky because people that get the retail they're paying reasonable money for these watches. You know, I'm sure we'd all love to have the opportunity now to buy a 5711 with a green dark for retail, absolutely, oh, yeah. yeah, but it's just not gonna happen. So, no, even, even you know, Travis Scott, he's always batting around with the, his mental APs on, he's, he's even getting free or, or pay by AP, so you never. Never know what's going Look on. The F1 boys. Yeah. You know? Who's the guy the other day who lost the um... Norris? Yeah, the RM. Yeah, Arthur. the McLaren. Lost the I, McLaren. I was amazed. It's four hundred and it's, it's a between a four fifty and five hundred grand watch. He drove a, a McLaren to Wembley with half a million pound on his wrist, and he got robbed. I was amazed. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. <laughs> couldn't believe that went on. And, he, and he's and he's a celebrity. Yeah, he's yeah. not. He's not a big lad either. Bless him. I mean, it's not. It's yeah. not funny. Like craziest he's thing a good is lad. though. The, the, the mad thing about that, which is just like unbelievable, he probably got given another one the very next day. I suspect so. I don't know which one it was, and I don't know if it's like a piece unique for him. What the, the, the one the McLaren got, on, yeah? It was it the McLaren, yeah, McLaren one, yeah. McLaren, yeah. The McLaren. It's probably got a special number on it or something. So. He's probably got something to grow, but I'm sure they'll yeah. chuck another one out. Yeah. I wanted to throw something else out there, yeah. right? Um, <clears throat> so there's obviously the direct investment into these assets that actually <clears> make you money, whether it, you know, uh, over time it goes up and it appreciates. But then I've always had the mindset, if you're in the right circles and it only works if you're in the right circles, it can make you money, but indirectly, because it can open doors. I'll give you a perfect example. I bought this a few years ago, right? I paid four grand over, over the list. I've got a 59.90 on uh, Protect Philippe. Um, I absolutely adore this watch because one is Protect Philippe and I think it's one of the best watches in the world. But two, it is stainless steel, and I think it's a bit more, a bit more discreet, and I mm. kind of like that. Yeah. Especially in the industry I'm in, it's nice to have a nice watch on, but a watch that I feel that resonates with big art collectors, yeah. you know. And I think it's always a good talking point. And when I went to a property seminar, uh, and I met met Rob Moore, who uh, uh, who's got the disruptive entrepreneur. He also has the uh, progressive property. He does very, very well for himself. The only reason why we started talking is because he noticed this watch. And he started really going into it. And after that conversation, I got invited onto his podcast with Kieran Richardson, the ex Man United footballer, Rob Moore. And we were basically having a conversation like this it was about art, it was about watches, and about property. And we spoke. And off the back of that podcast that he shared on, you know, he's got millions and millions of followers on this podcast on YouTube, I ended up getting a couple of people contacting me. They ended up coming down here and buying Richard Hamilton after they got exposed to the narrative of, of the story. And it taught me a lesson that. If you do have certain things and you went in certain circles, going back to the old cliche saying your network yeah. determines your net worth, I honestly do stand by that. So have you had similar sort of experiences? Would you say that if you're in the right circles with these kind of assets, you can, um, conversations can be born from, from them sort of scenarios? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, just, it, it sounds really basic, doesn't it? But just batting around in a nice car and you know people think you thinking that you're doing well you know humans they're simple things you know they buy into success they don't want to speak to you they think you're a loser but a lot of the time there's no interest driven online or in person you know you think someone's you know struggling and scruffling around and whatever you know, they think you're doing well then they're going to want to talk to you they want to know your backstory they want to you know and, and especially if there's someone that's high net worth and they've got an interest in the same asset class as you so you know you're in a collectible fire or whatever it is and you have a chat about it and you've instantly got a mutual ground. Yeah, and a lot of these high net worth guys as well, they're used to people trying to sponge off them and whatever, and then they think you're in the mix, kind of doing what they're up to, yeah. and they're gonna, and I know it sounds basic because it's only, it's only pieces of metal. Yeah. The day, but it it's does sad. establish, it's it, 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 it is. <clears throat> and I think also sometimes, you know, you turn up to a job interview or you go for a meeting with a client or whatever, 
and you're wearing 100 grand on your wrist, in the same vein, sometimes that can do you down as well. Yeah. Sometimes, yeah. yeah, it doesn't always work in your favor, but no, 100%, and I, I've, I've had situations like that as well, which I just think, that's bonkers, that shouldn't make sense. But. It, it's for me a bit of the icebreaker, you know, yeah. it yeah. only works again if you're speaking to someone that um, is kind of thinking the way you think. Yeah. So Rob Moore being a property guy, obviously into his watches and cars, of course, mm. but noticed it and he said that, he even admitted on the podcast, he said, you are exactly how I thought a Patek 5990 person would be. Yeah. And it's weird, isn't it? Because they box you into yeah. a category once you've got a nice car and everything else. Um, so for yourself, you know, have, have you had a lot of experiences like that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just, I think what Tom said was very accurate. You know, it, it works in certain ways very well as a talking point and a bit of an icebreaker to get the to get the juices flowing but also in other times like for example if you're wearing a watch and you're going somewhere to pick someone to win some work from them and you're going to charge them a certain amount of money and you're wearing a hundred grand watch they might think I'm going to go with this guy <laughs> he's obviously making loads of money up his watch budget. Yeah. but if you're dealing with someone like yourself in a gallery where you're dealing with high network uh, high priced assets then obviously, you know, it, it goes hand in hand. So it's the same with the cars. You know, if us three was to be out in a bar, you've got that on, you've got that on. My one's not nowhere near the same value, but it's still like an iconic watch. It's a talking point to start, you know. Same as if you two pulled up outside Costa, you both had your Lambos, you're gonna have a chat. Yeah. So it is a talking point. Man. It's the same as, I mean, this amazing place here, it's the same thing, you know, you don't need this space, you don't need it in the locations in, you don't need it to be nice to sell art. Like you know what you're talking about, you know what you're doing, you have your network, but it's like people, it's an instant kind of buying of trust. They turn up and they think, these blokes have got this gaff. They, you know, they know what they're doing. It's, it's kind of the same thing. The only reason you have a nice place is because you know, you're that level and you're kind of sort of um, watermarking yourself and saying, yeah, this is, this is where we are. We've got mm. the car gallery kind of thing. Um, and Sometimes it's the same with, with watches, but yeah, I've definitely, definitely come on stuck before job interviews back in the city. Oh, yeah. I'm, like, I'm gonna wear the yeah. most aggressive watch in there. Yeah. And the bloke interviewing me is probably gonna be on 50 times what I'm earning, yeah. wearing like the model below. <laughs> well, yeah. Ozzy, uh, a friend of ours who's got like, large private care homes in the country, I mean, there's been so many little nuggets of advice of information he gave me and he's like in his 50s now and he's a very, very successful man. And he said to me, whenever you're going to a, an interview or a meeting with, let's say, the local authority uh, to do with yeah. property or planning permission, a lawyer or an accountant, the last thing you want to do is have a bit of flash jewelry on your wrist because they're just going to think, all right, stick 10, 20, 30% on top of the yeah. product I'm going to give them. Yeah. You know, That's or true. they're going to have your, your, your pants down because they think you've got a lot more money. Yeah. And it's, if it's out of sight, it's out of their mind. Yeah. They may know you're a success, but the moment you put, you know, 50, 100 grand watch in front of them, they're, they're going to. It's, might not, might not, not, might not work in, in, no, in your favour. In favour, yeah. Uh, do you know what I think as well now with this sort of day and age, it really is quite difficult with nice cars, watches, nice clothes. I love my nice things. I really do. I love my watches. I love my nice clothes. I love nice cars. But there's always something of me that just thinks I don't want to be judged. You know, and mm. in this day and age, we do live in a day and age where people are regularly judged by if they're doing something. They can't just generally like the car. Can't be like, oh, you just really like the car, you went and bought it. It's like, it's oh, I've flash, had, yeah. I've had yeah. uh, got back to my car before and they spit on it. Um, I've had a note or put on my car yeah. and they've never met me and they didn't even see me get out of the car, yeah. but they had to do something to the car because they judged me based upon the car that I had. I always hear it driving around and you can see it in the rearview mirrors and often the passenger will cock it instead of me. Just the C word, all sorts, usually in the Lambo to be fair. Really? The old stuff, never. Yeah. People love it. It's yeah. like kids, it? old people, the old stuff, fine. New Lambo, forget it. Everyone hates you. Crazy. Absolutely hates you. Um, I think it's quite a British thing, though. Yeah, I think yeah. so. I don't think you no. get that in the States. I think it's it's more of a British thing. Well, I I, I think I think I had this before with the Lambo of Ferrari and uh, got a few Sicilian mates, um, again, come from a very successful family. And I was telling them about, you know, some of the, 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 the drama I have with people calling me this and that or whatever. And this is funny because back in Italy, where these cars are, are made, they, they give you a round of applause. Yeah, As yeah, you go yeah. down the street, they will stand there really? and go, 
But, well, they're just classed Italians, really. Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I shouldn't say that now with, with what's gone on recently with football, but, <laughs> <laughs> but even the way they conduct themselves after winning, they're just, they're just brilliant. Yeah. They're just brilliant. I think the Brits are, uh, they can be an awful lot. It puts to shame sometimes. Yeah. I do think, though, what you're saying is a rule of thumb, you know, it does. You know, if you've got nice watch, car, <laughs> even art, you know, if you, if you have a business meeting with someone, you invite them around your home, you've got nice art. It is just a talking point, isn't it? I mean, it gets the it really it's a juices is. flowing. It really does. And ultimately, you know, you drive down the street and you've got two places selling smoothies, right? And you're thirsty, you're like a fancy smoothie. You've got one that looks like a shack, and you've got one that's like all nicely yeah. like lit up and brand new. Looks all like looks like they're killing it. People like you're just going to go in there. You're going to go to the business that you think doesn't need the money, and that's just human human nature. Yes. I'm afraid. Unfortunately, it is. And that's why I think yourself, me, especially with what you're doing. When you're doing, you know, growing your business and growing your brand, it is so important to make sure you're always making sure you, you know, your company or your brand or your influence in is the fair, best it possibly My can. business is making myself look like I'm doing well. Whether I am or I'm not <laughs> is another thing. That's my that's my kind of internal struggle. But come on, you are doing well. Let's be honest, have it right. Let's go to companies out. Let's go to companies out right now. No, don't do that. Um, let's round this off then. So September, um, yeah. the 18th and the 19th. I'm really looking forward to being there and also presenting. Yeah. I think we're the only art company doing a, a talk on the art market. Yeah, there, as well there's, as... yeah, there's another guy there, but he's just doing his own independent art. But yeah, you're in terms of a gallery and investment house. Yeah. Good stuff. And obviously there's going to be a bunch of other people doing presentations. So yeah. talk to us about the venue, how many people are going to be there and kind of what to expect to bar the obvious, which is watches. Yeah, obviously it's based at the Grosvenor House in Park Lane. Um, which is just a beautiful venue. You've been there with yeah. you the other day, didn't I? Um, and you're going to have a huge array of luxurious companies. Uh, and, you know, there's probably going to be expected between 1,500 and 2,000 people over the weekend. So you've got 100 independent companies. I've got live music throughout the entire weekend. There's an after party, which is hosted by Soul Town on the Saturday, which is going to be really, really good. Am I invited um, to that? Or? Of course you are, mate. Of course you are. <laughs> Thanks, We've mate. actually brought some uh, VIP tickets along with us today because we was going to give. We're going to do a giveaway, right? Yeah, we are. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, it's, listen. It's. I think I'll just let the event do the talking. If I'm honest. I'm excited. Can't wait. Oh, yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. Good stuff. Well, I can't wait to be there. I think. I think for for me, um, you know, even just you bringing some of these great watches down, it inspires me. I mean, I'm not in the market at the moment to buy any more watches, but. When I look at something, I think, right, how can I, you know, serve my clients, give value, so in the future, I might treat myself to one. Same with a car, same with maybe another piece of art. So that's number one. Number two, again, it's about the people I'm gonna meet. You know, I know there's gonna be like-minded people, there's gonna be driven people there, there's gonna be people which have come from all different, you know, backgrounds, and I'm, I'm really excited to see the diversity there. Yeah, good. Looking forward to having you, mate. Good stuff, all right. Well, uh, um, if you're getting some value out of this, please follow uh, everybody on this uh, on, on the sofa today. Uh, follow my uh, uh, YouTube channel, also my podcast, The Stephen Sully Study. And um, if you want to know anything more about the art market, please contact Woodbury House at woodburyhouseart.com. Thank you. Done? How do you think that went? Right? I think it's pretty good. Pretty yeah. good.